Welcome to The Real Estate Show on WGBF AM with your host, Charlie Butler. This is where you'll learn to sell your home quickly and for more money. And now, the host of The Real Estate Show, the guy who guarantees to sell your home or he'll buy it himself, Charlie Butler. Good Sunday morning, Tri-State. This is The Charlie Butler Show. Uh, I'm Charlie Butler and with my co-host, Abby Barr. Good morning, Charlie. Well, good morning, Abby. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. It's Sunday and it's football day. And it, it is. You, so you're ready, as they say on the commercial, you're ready for some football. That's huh? exactly right. All right. <laughs> um, we're gonna, we've are we got later in the year and into next year, we've got a lot of great guests scheduled, but Evan and I are going to do something different for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've had, you know, a lot of people are wondering about, you know, some of the what we would call the myths in real estate and uh you know we just we want to answer some frequently asked questions yes yes and you know they might be really basic questions but just going a little bit more in depth as to what exactly mean it means to be pre-qualified or well is involved with writing an offer or listing your home or things like that yeah, I think I think uh, I think you're right. I mean, a lot of this stuff will seem basic to us, but some people only do it one or two times their entire life. So, uh, you know, this is our profession, so we deal with it every day. But most people, most people don't. No, no, and also I think whenever someone is in the middle of financing their home or searching for their new house. Um, they're so overwhelmed with so many things to remember and it, it can be scary going through it. And I think definitely your office is very good at holding the home buyer's hand and walking them through the process and making it as easy as possible. Well, we really, and I know, I know you're also the same way. We really try to pride ourselves on, on the customer experience yes. on the overall customer service, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we really, really feel that that's important. Not only do we want to take good care of the customer, but also from a business point of view, um, if we take good care of that customer, uh, they're going to refer us. That's exactly right. To someone else, which is, you know, which is good for our business too. And, uh, and hopefully we can help more people. I, you know, it's never, I always, and it happens, unfortunately, I always hate the transactions and I really feel bad for the side when one side walks away and doesn't feel like that they were treated fairly. You know, that's that's the kind of transactions that just you don't leave feeling good. Right. And I always hate to hear about the transactions where the people involved, the professionals and experts involved are not communicating with the buyer and seller. Um, I've had realtors call me who say, Hey, I've got this buyer. He has some credit issues. We think they can be fixed, but he was just told he, you know, whatever lender he talked to just can't do the loan for him. And that was it. And credit is so important anymore that especially in that situation, you need to work out a plan and the expert, whether it be the lender or the realtor, um, should really be able to talk people through the entire home buying process. No, a- absolutely. And you made me think of something before I forget it, though. I want to. I yeah. want to touch on this. And you correct me if this is not in place yet, but I know the the FICO scores as far as how they were going, how they were doing the FICO scores that changed, like. And- in July, in July, was it the FICO nine? Yeah, I I know on my side of it, I didn't, I haven't seen a big change yet. Um, Charlie, I don't have a definite on if it did go into effect or if it is going into effect. Um, they're supposed to be changing how they weight some of the things that go into your credit score. Um, they're also supposed to be changing how I see a credit report. Um, normally I see a credit report. I see what your minimum monthly payment is, what your current balance is, and whether you had any past dues for 30, 60, or 90 days. Right. What the credit report's going to on the actual reporting side is it will show me a 24-month history of 
what your balance was, what your minimum payment was, and what you actually paid, and whether or not you were 30, 60, or 90 days past late. So that way, we have a true snapshot of how you use your credit, and it's really being put into place so you don't have someone that always runs up their credit cards, but they pay something down just for the mortgage transaction for a month or two, and then they pop the the credit line back up. They use up all their credit again. That's really supposed to be what's to stop. Yeah, and I don't I don't think a lot of people understand. Um, uh, I know some of these large investors understand it because you will say that I that I've dealt with and still deal with their credit scores while they pay everything on time are not really all that good because they carry such a huge debt load. Yes. You know, they, they may carry, you know, in, in many cases, a multi-million dollar debt load. While yes. they can easily service it, it's still lower, you know, it still pushes their credit score down and, uh, and you will not see them ever have a late, but, uh, I know, I'm sure you get this where someone on it's come, comes in to buy a house and, and they said, well, and you let them know, well, you've got, too many open open charge accounts, something like that. Yes. And they say to you, but I pay everything on time. Yes. So and the the biggest myth that there is with credit scores is people constantly watch their credit scores on a credit karma or Trangi and I think offers one. There's multiple ones out right. there. But the one thing not every consumer realizes is that credit score is different than the credit score I get. I've had quite a few people who I pull their credit report, call them back and say, hey, your credit, co- your credit score is this. And they say, well, that isn't what whatever reporting they watch is. And why it is, is the credit score comes back based, <coughs> based on the risk of why your credit's being pulled. So... If you hop on Credit Karma and you pull your credit report and you have an 800 credit score, it might be a few points less than what I see because I'm pulling it for you to finance a home, which is a whole lot more high risk than you just checking on it. Right. And uh, there's, I I, I don't think people overall, unless they, they buy a lot of houses. Right. You know, they don't understand everything that goes into what you guys look at and credit. And one of the things, and we've, you know, from a realtor side, we've had this happen many times, and I'm sure you have to from a mortgage side, someone, you approve them for a loan. Yes. And, uh, you know, we make the offer. You know, they're getting ready to close on the house. And uh, so, and they buy, in the meantime, they buy a house full of furniture, thinking, okay, they've already approved me. Why shouldn't I? I had this conversation a lot of times. So every I'm going to ask you, why can't they do that? Because we will do a soft pull on your credit prior to closing. So if you've gone out and you've gotten the furniture, you've gotten a new credit card, you've got a new car, all of that will show up prior to closing. We'll have to resubmit your file to underwriting. And if your payments are too high for your income, that could kill your entire deal. There's actually a form in Waterstone's initial application disclosure disclosures, which I love, that says don't jeopardize your loan. And it goes through and it tells you, you know, don't have anyone pull your credit report. Don't start moving money around between accounts, uh, checking in savings accounts. Don't go out and get a new credit card or buy furniture or anything like that. It covers all of that because it is so important to keep your credit as much as possible the same as when we initially pulled your application. We understand that you might have a credit card that you use for business that's showing up and you truly pay it off every month. So the normal transactions that you do, go ahead with those. Just don't do anything new. I actually had a borrower that he had some things on his credit report that were negative. And so we worked on getting his credit score pulled back up and we were able to do that. And 
I wound up talking to him whenever he thought he had found a home. And he says, well, just so you know, I increased this credit line. I took out a new credit card. And I said, wait, why did you do that? And he said, well, I'm trying to pull up my credit score. I said, we already have your credit score where it needs to be. So if you do get pre-approved, unless your loan officer tells you for some reason you need to do something with your credit, try and keep it as constant as when they initially took your application because it can make a difference in the end. Yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot of times people think we just try to scare them, you know, no. by this. And, <laughs> and we're not because I'm sure Abby has, and I have too, seen, seen people They've got, you know, they've got the house, they're ready for closing. You know, they bought the house full of furniture and it threw them when that, when that soft pull, try yes. merge, however, whatever term you want to use, uh, was pulled, uh, it, uh, it threw them where they didn't qualify anymore. Yes. Yes. And even with your employment, um, we love to see consistent employment. So if you would go to change jobs while you're in the middle of being pre-approved or if you've found a house and you're in the middle of the loan, be sure to tell your loan <coughs> officer. Um, I had another borrower who switched jobs and it was more money by 3 or $4 an hour. But I told him, okay, it's a new job in a different line of work than what you've been working. So now we need to wait for you to have a 30 day pay stub before we can really do anything. So any, any major life changes in regards to income assets or credit, be sure to tell your lender about. Yeah. It's, that's another one. It's never fun when people say, Oh, I quit my job, you know, uh, <laughs> but you know, we're closing in two weeks. Yeah. yeah we may not be, you know, uh, the, <coughs> excuse me. Um, also something else I know that, Many times it's I we get these calls and it's on something on your side is uh, maybe someone has of their own funds they have an inadequate down payment, but they say grandpa grandpa or grandma will give me that twenty thousand dollars. We'll just pull a number out yes. of the air, uh, and that's that's not as simple in your world as as that is. It's it? not anymore. Thanks to government guidelines. Um, and no. why? Yeah, yeah, besides government guidelines, why is it not simple? It's not simple because the underwriter, I always like to blame everything on the underwriter. Absolutely. We can't um, talk to them, so you, know, <laughs> you guys always blame them. You know. Yes. Um, but the underwriter and the lender likes to make sure that you didn't did not go out and get a loan for this money. So if you have a gift, then we need to document it. You know, the donor of the gift has to complete a letter. They have to sign off on it. And that letter states that you are not required to pay them back those funds. Um, we have the buyer sign off on it as well. And then sometimes we do require to document showing that the funds have been in the donor's uh, bank account just so we know they didn't go out and get a loan just right. so they could forward the bank to you. So, so from, from, from your point of view or from the borrower's point of view for mm -hmm. the, for that matter, yeah. what would, if, if they, if they need that money, yes. What would be better to get that money gifted to them or to get a parent grandparent to co-sign for them? It, <coughs> Each situation's different. Um, I really anymore, I don't do too many loans with co-signers on them. And why is that? Because how the lender sees it is you can have a co-signer on your loan that's not going to live in the house. But the initial applicant has to be able to support the loan themselves. So... More than likely, if we put a co-signer on there, it's probably due to needing a higher credit score or someone with more credit experience is a better way to put that. Um, a lot of people get gifts, and they really are not that hard to document. Um, it's, it's really 
easy to document um, that we can apply gifts to different types of loans, um, whether it be a conventional loan, um, a FHA, USDA, VA. I mean, all loans, you're really allowed to get gifts. Normally, where you're not allowed to get gifts is if someone's buying an investment property. Right. And that's what, and I, that was actually just going through our mind as far as anyone listening that uh, is is thinking of buying a, an investment property or doing commercial loans. Everything we've talked about, forget because it doesn't apply. Because when you walk, that's exactly com- right. When you walk commercial <laughs> side of the bank, uh, it's not credit score driven. No. It, you know, because the, sometimes the credit scores of the best clients are lower because of their debt load. Yes. Uh, it's not. Uh, as one banker said to me one time, you know, this side, the commercial side of the bank is a wild west of real estate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the funny thing is, if you talk to a commercial banker, they don't want to touch residential real estate, what I do. And I would never want to touch a commercial loan. And I think it's two different ways of thinking about the loan and the person's, the person's credit and approval. It's just completely different. I had a local bank president one time. We were talking about commercial lending, and he told me, and I asked him sometimes, you know, how you make a decision when sometimes you turn down maybe even a high net worth person and take someone a little more marginal a, a deal, right? And uh, remember, this is on the commercial side. He said, "Well, he said if if I talk to him, and after we're done talking, I've been through everything their their project." If I'm if everything goes bad, if I can say to myself they're going to do everything they can to pay me back, he said then I'm probably going to do the loan. He said if I'm not sure they're going to pay me back, doesn't matter what their what their financial status is, I'm probably not going to do the loan. Wow. Yeah. So it's that gut feeling. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's very much on that side a relationship business. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and I've seen that in action several times. Um, and I think it's one of those things also that as many tax returns as I've looked at, and I'm, God knows I'm not a CPA, um, but if someone's self-employed or they have multiple businesses and they want to finance their new house, (coughs) I have to dig through all of those and looking at tax return returns, everybody knows that you want to write off as much as you can because you want to owe the least amount to the government. We all know that. Right. And so those numbers don't always hold true with what a commercial person's real financial picture is. Yeah. In, in, uh, on the commercial side, again, they'll want to see financial statements Yes, and you know, they'll look at, you know, they'll look at other assets that, uh, may not be, as liquid as something that would Correct. show up on a tax return. Correct. Um, I wanted. I wanted to narrow. We're talking about credit scores, things like that, but debt to income ratio. Yes. Another thing I, I'm not sure people always understand, and I use, and I can think of a deal that I did once or many many years ago. And correct me if I'm wrong on the percentages here. Okay. But it was a USDA deal. Yes. Hundred percent down. It's a house in Boonville. Uh, lady that man that was buying it was manager of a one of the fast food chains up there, and uh, her I think your debt to income, which I'll have you explain in a minute, it could be forty one point five percent on USDA. Uh, forty one or forty three. Yeah, somewhere in that. Yes. Range. Anyway, so for it's somewhere around forty one point five percent. So, uh, hers came in at forty one point six percent. Yes. So I happened to know the head of the USDA. So I thought I'm going to be a big shot. And I'll call you the, the guy, the local head, I mean. You know, yes. And call him up. And, and I almost used his name right there. But I won't. <laughs> uh, and I said, what can we do about this? And he said, well, we can get to 41.5. You know, I mean, it, it's that cut and dry. Yes. As the kind of where I'm leading you to. It, but, uh, and it, as we found out later, she hadn't included her Christmas bonus. Which which, oh. which made it yeah you know, which made it good yes which and she was able to get the house but debt to income another thing people hear yes but 
You want to explain it? What your debt to income ratio is, is whenever we pull your credit report on there, <laughs> we're going to see your minimum minimum monthly payments for any credit cards you have, auto loans, anything, any type of installment loan is going to show up on that credit report. So we only take the minimum monthly payment shown on that. You can pay extra every month. That's fine by us, but we're just looking at the minimum monthly payment. We're going to add those up. We're going to include your new housing payment. And what we consider your new housing payment is your principal and interest, the monthly payment for your homeowner's insurance, monthly payment for property taxes, and if you have mortgage insurance, that monthly payment. We'll add all of those together, divide it by your monthly income, and that gets your debt to income ratio. Different mortgage programs have different requirements for your debt to income ratios. Um, and also different lenders have different requirements for what they will allow on debt to income ratios. Um, VA loans. I know I've had a borrower with a VA or he was financing VA and his debt to income ratio, I want to say was at 50% or higher and the system accepted it. So VA was going to accept it. That situation to me is a little bit scary. Um, but in this man's scenario, he had a spouse at home that had a good job and we just were not paying her on the loan. So I felt more comfortable with it. Normal debt to income ratios that I like to see because I'm on the conservative side is between 40 and 45%. But I believe FHA will allow us to go up to 47%. I was going to say, and I, I knew FHA, I was thinking, was one of the higher ones. Yes, yes. And FHA and VA both are. So um, what can people do? I mean, I, I know it sounds like a simple question, but uh, <laughs> what can people do to get their debt to income? If, if, I'm, if I need to be at 43 for whatever, for the program that I want to be on and I'm at 45 now, Yes. What can I what can I do to get to get that down? If you pay down a credit card, um, and we can update what that monthly payment is and it's a lower payment, uh, that's one way to do it. And just the thing about credit cards and your credit score, I've had guys that work in the credit industry just you know, getting people's credit scores built up. They say do not put more than 30% of the limit on your credit card. The minute you go over 30% of that limit, then it starts having a negative effect on your credit score. So it's very important to keep it at 30% of your limit or below. Um, and honestly, I'm bringing down debt to income ratio. It usually just is what it is. Maybe... You know, maybe we need to adjust what the loan amount is if you have more money to put down. Right. So that way your housing payment is lower. Um, I've actually seen lenders who have called the homeowner's insurance agent. I would have never thought to do this, but call the homeowner's insurance agent and see if there's anything they can tweak in the annual insurance premium to get it down. So, you know, it's, it's really... Having a loan officer that's willing with their to work with their borrower to get the entire deal to work. Um, while we're while we're on the on the subject, I'm just I, I'm writing down things as they pop in my <laughs> mind here, Evie. So I'm I'm, I'm going to take you all over the place here. Um, someone who doesn't have credit, but yes. you know, we we get this we get this all the time. People say, "I'd love to buy a house." You know, I'm working at. Uh, and I'll use Toyota as an example. Since, right. You know, it's a pretty good job there. You know, I'm working at Toyota. I'm making good money, but I'm 23 years old and I just don't have hardly any credit at all. And there are there are things you can do. Yes. As far as alternative credit, things yes. like that that you can do to, to help them any, build that. Any more, at least with Waterstones programs, Someone on the loan has to have a credit score starting out. Okay. So, you know, if if you have a borrower that just does not have a credit score, 
then you've got to have somebody on there that does have a credit score. What I tell a lot of people to do is contact their bank, see if they can do a secured credit card. And what the bank's going to have you do, deposit, say, $500, $1,000, however much, into a savings account. They're going to issue a credit card to you. You can use it to buy whatever you want. <coughs> but if you default on the credit card, then at least the bank has that $500 or 1000 in the savings account that they can go back and collect from it if you know, you default on the credit card, right. but it's a great way to build up your credit. Um, big thing, like I said, don't pay any more than 30% of the limit on the credit card and use it for things that you normally pay cash for your groceries, um, your, uh, gas. If you are used to going out to dinner, that's fine. Put it on the credit card, but be sure to pay it off each month. So you're not incurring any interest and keep it below 30% of the limit. That's what I've always loved about uh, American Express is yes. you you basically have no limit. Uh, well, I mean, I'm sure there's a limit somewhere, but yes. you know, I've, I've never hit. But you've got to pay it off yeah. you know, that month. Yeah. Uh, now they've got some other programs where you don't, but... You know, if you want to discipline yourself, that's a great way to do yes. it right there. Yes. Now, you were talking about building credit. I have had some borrowers that might only have one trade line on their credit report, and we did need to build their credit. What we wound up doing is contacting their cell phone company if they've been with them for 12 months and getting a history of how they've paid. We can do the same thing with car insurance or even Vectoran. Vectoran, uh, whoever they rent you know, if they're renting their apartment or their home and even storage facilities, we've done that before for borrowers. So that's a good way to build your credit as well, as well. But the key thing is for them to, uh, to have, uh, have 12 months. Yes. Yes. Okay. If you don't have 12 months, it won't work. And if you, and if you've been late on a couple of those, don't tell, don't use those with Abby. Okay. No, that won't yeah. work either. Yeah. Yeah. If you're late on your storage unit. You know, use your cell phone. Okay. Yes. Nobody's yes. ever late on their cell phone because nobody can live without their cell phone. That's so, exactly you know, right. You know, a quick story. It has nothing to do with real estate. I guess technically it does. A friend of mine who is a, who owns a funeral home. Mm -hmm. And we were talking one day. I said, you know, I bet you have a, I bet you have a heck of a collection problem. I said, because how, you know, if people don't have insurance and you go ahead and bury them, yeah. how are you going to collect? He said, in 30 some years, he's had one person he didn't get paid. Oh, he said, wow. Everybody pays me. He said, because nobody wants to be known as the people that didn't pay for the loved one's funeral. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, who would have thought, you know, the, the 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 funeral home was was the guy that always gets paid you know. <laughs> but uh but anyway um we've got about two minutes left uh evie we've been telling you know how they can do it now how can they get a hold of you to do some of these things they need to give me a call at 812-463-3199 or they can always email me as well at ebar, B-A-R-R, -R, at waterstonemortgage.com. And I would love to hear from our listeners. And uh, also, if, you know, if you're going to need a house before, you know, yes. uh, you, you go to Evie. So call our great buyers and listing agents. Uh, the numbers are our buyers agents are 812-430-1708. They can help you right away. Puts you in a great home. There's some, there's some really neat listings out there right now. If you are looking to sell your home, remember for the, for the listings uh, uh, with the Charlie Butler team, if we can't sell it, we'll buy it. Uh, talk, and uh, call us about that, and you can reach us at 812-449-0050 or charliebutlerteam.com. And, Evie, what's your website? Uh, waterstonemortgage.com. And I think we got to go. And it's uh, for Evie Barr. This is Charlie Butler. And have a great Sunday. You've been listening to The Real Estate Show on WGBF AM with the guy who guarantees to sell your home or he'll buy it himself, Charlie Butler. Join us every week at this time to find out how to sell your home quickly and for more money. For more information, email cbutler at kw.com or visit charliebutlerteam.com.